And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Heather Taylor from Mount Shasta, who during her near-death experience encountered archangels and the Reaper. Heather, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you. It's very great to be here and I'm excited. Well, we are excited to have you. And if you don't mind, let's start on the day that you had that NDE and go from there. Well, on that particular NDE, um, I was getting ready to move. I had been guided by the mountain to not leave. And I was trying to save a marriage. So the has my ex-husband, he wanted to uh, leave. And he had, you know, burned some bridges in Mount Shasta and I was thriving in Mount Shasta. It's definitely my soul's home still to this day. And uh, I didn't listen to the message. So I was going to get my U-Haul and decided that I was having an allergy. I was having some kind of bad thing happen to me. I was feeling sick. And so I stopped at an urgent care to make sure I was okay. And the urgent care said, oh, you need antibiotics. And so they gave me, administered this. And we're just going to give you a liquid antibiotic right now. And then you can, you know, take some home with you. And I told them I'm moving. I'm moving back to Idaho, which is auspicious because my, my first adult near-death experience was in Idaho. <laughs> you know, so here I am. I'm getting ready to go to Idaho. And... Um, I go in, they give me the antibiotic. They say, we want you to wait because I already have a lot of antibiotic allergies. And the next thing I know, I started to go into anaphylaxis and I started swelling. And so they stabbed me with an EpiPen and called an ambulance, took me to the ER. And once I arrived at the ER, they let me go and said, you know, oh yeah, you're, you'll be okay. You had the EpiPen. We gave you some stuff, some medicine, you'll be fine. And by the time I got to the parking lot, I started to go through anaphylaxis again. So they took me back in and administered me or administered me, gave me some, um, another EpiPen shot I had. And then they put me in the uh, ICU. First, they started with the MICU, which is like, you know, the in-between. You know, it's dangerous, but not completely dangerous yet. And they kept giving me EpiPen shots. Well, for whatever reason, I ended up in there 11 days. I had over 50 EpiPen shots, was moved into the ICU. And about halfway through, um, my heart couldn't take it. And I had a heart attack and I died. Now, the auspicious part for me, um, is that I have a friend, I, I have a psychic friend of mine. And when her and I talk, we tell each other's futures. You know, we don't catch up on what happened. We're like, hey, oh my gosh, I'm seeing this and I'm seeing that. And, and she's that way as well. And nobody knew I was in the hospital. Nobody knew I was trying to save my marriage. I was just kind of, I'm a containment kind of person when I'm going through change. It's my sacredness. And as I feel more grounded, then I'll share it. So I die, and when I'm there, there's like this being to my right and being to my left, and they're bright. Everything was so bright. And then in front of me was this dark shape. And in front of me, this dark shape, which was the Reaper, um, was very neutral feeling. I felt very safe, very grounded with him. And I say him loosely because it feels as though the reaper is neither female nor male, is neither dark nor light. It just simply is a frequency of holding space and carrying the soul energy into the next aspect of consciousness. So he says, are you ready to go? And at the time I was teaching ascension classes where I was teaching people how to move through all of their chakra systems into past life, present life, future life and learning uh, techniques of alignment and embodiment. So when he said, are you ready to go? I was like, are you kidding me? Let's go. I was excited. And um, then the two beings to my right and left stopped me and said, if you go, you won't come back. 
your time is done here. Your, your karma is done here. You're not coming back to earth. This is your last life. And it was really kind of a weird moment because I had finally been out of the wheelchair. I had finally really started my word of mouth. I've been word of mouth for almost 25 years now. And so I really started my word of mouth. My nine-year-old was only two. And I was like, I have five kids. I just started helping people. Are you crazy? I just started, you know? And then I was up. That's it. I was back. And um, my ex-husband had my phone. And he had his hand down. And he's like looking shocked. And I'm kind of disoriented. Like, I'm back. And so I look at him and everybody's breathing and they're like, we can't give her any more EpiPen shots. The allergy specialist is on vacation out of country. What are we going to do? You know? And so he starts reading this Facebook, Facebook message that came from my friend who is this year. And she basically said, Hey, Heather's guides are talking to me. She's from New York. So she was like, I know they're not mine because mine aren't that nice. (laughs) And she says, she has Archangel Michael and uh, Metatron beside her. And they are letting her know that she has a choice here. And what they were telling me was that, you know, she said, you don't have to die. You can choose it, but this is your choice. This is a crossroad where you get to choose whether you want to stay or go. And if you stay, these are the things that are going to change. Your eating habits are going to change. It's going to be a healing process. Like there was this whole checklist of things I was going to have to face should I choose to stay. And so I was like, oh my goodness, I um, I want to stay. And so right as I was, and I didn't say this, it was just this thought in my mind, like I already decided. And right as he finished reading, I started to swell again. And I remember they were coming in and they said, what do we do? What do we do? If we give her another EpiPen, she's going to have another heart attack. And the only thing they could do was give me the EpiPen. What does she swell from the inside out? Or we give her a heart attack and bring her back. So they went ahead and administered another EpiPen. And um, I was gone. And I was right back at that same spot. And there they were. You know, there's two beings beside me and there was the reaper saying the same thing. Are you ready to go? And I started asking questions. You know, it was almost like the first one was to say, hey, this is where you're at. And the second one was, let's get clear about your decision because I wasn't automatic response. You know, I I was open to traveling. I go to other planets with clients all the time and I'll speak a different language and the client will respond in a different language. You know, I I do all kinds of interesting things, but not coming back, I'm not done yet. I just, I felt like no way, you know, it's like that teenager that has that awesome car and then mom and dad want to take the car away. I was like, oh my gosh, I have these babies. I have this career that I love from my soul. No way. And so the reaper told me, he said, well, if you stay, you're going to have to go through a lot of trials and you're going to have to face yourself and you're going to have to make big decisions and you have to be in your power and you're going to have to walk alone with your children. And um, I didn't care. I said, I didn't care that I would do whatever it was that I needed to do to walk this path and that I am truly here to be an example and I'm truly here to hold space. And considering that this wasn't the first time I had died and I had multiple, you know, near-death experiences before, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid to die and I wasn't afraid to live. It was just kind of like, I'm continuing this life and I'm going to face it. So, um, a little bit of emotional moment. So excuse me and thank you for your patience. Um, so I came back and they had me on crazy steroids 
you go to my website, you can see how, what I look like. I went from a size five to a size 22 in like a month. And uh, it was really kind of intense because in part of the instructions that I was given was like, you're gonna have to rebuild your energy and you know, the last time I had died before that, I didn't get instructions. I just had to deal with it. And this time I was getting full on instructions. So I said, okay. And I gained a bunch of weight and I couldn't eat bread and I couldn't drink milk anymore. And it wasn't lactose. It was like an enzyme that my body couldn't process. And I couldn't leave the house, which was the same as before, because I can see so much. It's like when I passed and came back, I'm hypersensitive to everything. And each time it's like a different level of an upgrade that I would go through. And I don't know when you want to say upgrade. It's just like a different level of uh, sensitivity, if you will, because I don't really believe in the upgrade space. I think we're all upgrading and beautiful. It was more like I could see everybody's thoughts. I could see everybody's past and the path they were walking. I could see all the timelines and dimensions. I could see all the beings in different veils. I could see all the spirits. And here I am in Idaho where there's a massive count of deaths here. You know, so I, I'm at my sister's at this point. You know, leaving the hospital was really intense for me. I had a ferret, a pet ferret that I believe was my familiar. The last time I had had the heart attack, I think he took my death. My daughter's messaged and said he was playing fine. And all of a sudden he grabbed his heart and died. Um, and the crazy part was when I got out of the hospital and was heading towards Idaho, I wanted to bury him in the woods on the way through Oregon. And when I took him out of the cage, it was days and days. Rigor mortis had not set in. He was still warm to the point where I checked to see if he was still alive. Like maybe he's in meditation. You know what I mean? Like maybe he's going through some other process and he didn't move. And so I wrapped him up into my jacket and I hobbled out to this tree and I laid him down and said goodbye. And when I turned around to see him one last time, he was gone. And I thought, okay, macchiata. Macchiata came, which is the native word for Bigfoot. So I was kind of like, all right, okay. my He's coming back in some space, but it, he was um, really amazing and very sacred to me. So that was a powerful experience. So moving forward, I'm kind of jumping a little bit, but I'm having these memories, moments of memories as I'm sharing and um, being a little bit bossed around by spirit. So bear with me, please. So I get home or I get to my sister's, can't leave the house, super, super heavy. I feel like I'm walking around in a meat suit and I feel like the meat suit was a protective barrier because even in the meat suit, I could see and feel everything. And about, I don't know, four months, maybe four or five months later, my sister's like, it's time to get out of the house. Let's go to the mall, which again, the mall is the same place that I had gone the first time when I died the first time and came back in Idaho. I ended up in the mall and a similar thing happened. So we get to the mall and I'm very resistant. And I'm driving and I'm like um, passenger and I'm seeing all this stuff. And I get to the mall and I see a woman. And I said, Michelle, like, I can't go in here. And she said, why? And I said, because I can see everybody's pain. And I came in and I'm walking in and I'm, I'm really trying to just face this because I'm remembering the instructions, right? You got to face these things, face these things, show up. And I said, that woman's son died. And she said, yes, yeah, she did. Um, it's a small town and my sister knows everybody, right? And um, I said, but he didn't die the way everybody thinks he did. And my sister is like, everybody feels that. And so I just saw how he died. 
and the guilt and shame that the mother was walking around with. And I couldn't, um, I couldn't bear that pain. So we had to leave and I told her I'm not ready. So I went back to the house and I didn't leave the house, I think again for another three months. And it wasn't like, it wasn't like I was afraid. It was just so much energy, so much lost feelings, so much fear that I needed a minute to adjust. <laughs> you know, I needed to, I needed to kind of calibrate myself um, into this next space because this particular near death experience, it like opened to my my energetic presence, my spiritual path, my gifts, however you want to label it, the being that I am and how I work and the tools I use. It's like they were supercharged. And I I needed to get my bearings and learn how to use those supercharged tools, you know? So I did and I followed all the instructions and my sister said one day, she says, where is your soul's home? You can do what you do anywhere in the world. And my whole soul just started crying and said, Mount Shasta. And so I left my husband and packed up my kids and my dogs and drove to Mount Shasta and slept on my friend's floor in Dunsmere until I could find a place. So that is my last experience. Do you think that you would have been tempted so much by the Reaper that you had to have two archangels there to kind of keep you from going? Absolutely, 100%. I, I believe that, well, and here's the interesting thing is that, you know, Metatron, I have, I have beautiful elder teachers that I am, I am very honored to have in my life and and hope they live to be in their hundreds because they're all in their eighties. <clears throat> and one of them is the eldest. She's the oldest grandmother medicine woman on the planet today. And she's just amazing. So there's one of my, my mentors, um, teachers. So he has, he, he has a space that he built a pyramid. That is the mathematical replica of Giza. And, um, Metatron is one of the guardians of the uh, dodecahedron that he has that people go and sit in. It's called the Christ consciousness device. And every, the moment I came to Shasta, which was this, such a powerful experience, its own spiritual experience, right? So since I stepped foot on Mount Chester, was guided here. Metatron has always spoken to me and Metatron's always been a part of my world, but it's, it's different. It's like when you come on the mountain, it's almost amplified. Like Met, Met, Metatron is definitely a guardian in Mount Shasta and Archangel Mikael has always also been a part of my life. I was trafficked when I was younger and I escaped and it was Archangel Michael that guided me in with instruction to help me escape. So I, I think that, um, if they hadn't been there, I would have been like, yeah, because I had been doing these sessions with clients um, and having these powerful experiences. I was coming to Mount Shasta and I have photos and videos, fairies following me and, and beings with skulls and, and different kind of crystal skulls in different realms that you're seeing in the film footage and, you know, macchiata right above our head. So there's I've I continuously even just Japan I just came back I mean I had this very powerful experience with two golden koi fish and and the nine dragons so it, it's it's innately a part of my life and always has been since I was a little little which is probably why my first near-death experience was when I was so little um but Metatron is like a father energy for me and Mikhail is like a brother, like someone who just has my support. And because of what happened when I was a kid and was um, sick, I really trust that 
And I feel like that was a big part of what helped me to recognize. And maybe that's why they gave me the two choices. I think if I would have, if they wouldn't have said no the first time, I think I would have left. And I feel like there would have been a walk-in. I do. I feel like some a different being would have walked into my body and my kids would be getting raised by somebody else. And um, I really feel that. You referred to your ferret as a familiar, and I've never heard that term before. Can you tell me more about <laughs> that? Um, yes, I a part of my bloodline is Druid. I actually spent time in Ireland and Scotland um, learning about my Druid ancestral line. Druid tree is the same thing as Native American, really. We have the same seven holidays. I, I walk the red road, Native American. Um, in my film with Ruben, uh, interview with Ed, part two, you'll see one of my dear friends and teachers as I'm making a Native American drum the traditional way in prayer. So it's Druid, and this is my Druid drum. <laughs> so it's it's very much a part of my soul and my bloodline. And familiars are animals that souls that come in as animals and they uh, they walk beside you and they hold space for you and they're present with you. And um, it's really interesting because when they come back in another animal body, you almost always know it's them. Like my daughter has a familiar that's a horse and her horse from when she was five is now her horse now and it's weird because we had taken a photo and my daughter was like oh my gosh mom it's the same horse and it was their eyes and their facial expression was the same and they were doing the same and everything she does is completely what she did before so familiar is like a protector like in um take they'll take energy for you and they'll be there with you. And everybody has one. Would you say it's kind of like a guardian or a guide? Absolutely. I think it's um, a teacher. Well, a you, teacher that loves you unconditionally. You also mentioned that Bigfoot came and the familiar or the ferret went with him. Would you say the, the Bigfoot serves kind of like a reaper role? I don't think the ferret was dead. That's the weirdest part. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But the thing about familiars is it isn't like the regular soul, right? It's actually here for a mission. And so maybe the ferret went into another realm. Um, it's really funny. I've actually never shared this part of my story. So um, I, it was amazing. I, it was, I mean, even my kids were just like, mom, it's just gone the jacket was gone the ferret was gone everything was gone and it was quick and you know it was it's funny the first time my mother was in Shasta with me she you saw we had uh, macchiata who was playing with a deer and we were driving by and she was just like what the heck you know but they move through realms you know they're moving through portals of time they're moving through the dimension they're, they're they're realm travelers, so they jump in the dimension. So it's very possible he just swooped them up and went into another dimension or realm. And in that realm, the ferret was sustainable because the interesting part was is that he, rigor and mortis should have set in. He should not have been warm. He should not have been fluffy and cuddly and pliable. It, he probably should have started smelling by then. But the kids knew how much I loved this ferret. And they were like, we're not touching mom's ferret. So the, the fact that, that those things were there was already showing me, okay, this is something bigger than the human. You know, and where are we? We're spiritual beings having a human experience. And everybody's trying to get out. We're already out, people. It is about bringing that in and seeing your gifts and your magic and your beauty and every single person has it. And sometimes we just need that little nudge. For me, you know, the whisper 
never became a boom. Apparently I wasn't listening and I you know, wanted to leave the mountain. And, and that's kind of how that went. But we all have it. We just need to be willing to see it. Have you ever considered why you've had so many NDEs? Perhaps that's your life purpose is to keep going through these scenarios and processing them? You know, this is a beautiful question. And um, I was talking to my aunt. And so, you know, I didn't really have my family close to me growing up. So it's pretty much my mother and my sister and I. And we grew up in the ghetto in California, Southern California. So what, one of my questions was I, I was able to connect to one of my aunts and I told her, I said, you know, this is kind of what I've been going through and who I am. And she says, honey, she says, I've died four times and come back. Your grandma's died three times, your other aunt, your other aunt. So it's like all the females on our bloodline have had these near-death experiences. And I said, okay, well, what do you feel that's about? And, you know, I'm just kind of trying to explore that because I'm done having that. I'm ready to get into the joy. Like I really started my life in the darkness, surrounded by the darkness, right, surviving as a baby. And I'm, I'm good. You know, like I, I love the magic. I love the fairies and, and the different realms and the macchiata and the ghosts, you know, ghosts always seem to find me. And, and I, and I love that. I love helping them cross over and I love connecting that energy. I absolutely love helping people remember the magic in our consciousness. I think it's key and it is important. And I don't feel that I'd be able to see the way I do had I not gone through those experiences um, or the layers that I do, you know, being able to see timelines and dimensions and you know, there's really no such thing as time, but you know what I'm saying. Um, and having the alien contacts, you know, I mean, first abduction at three. So there's, there was all these things. And sometimes I feel like it's almost like I'm this being of energy that has been here so long. One of, one of my guides have tried to channel through me. So my voice changes, <laughs> bear with me here, <laughs> but it's like a being of energy that is able to see different layers of all people's belief systems, right? It's like when I go and I'm sitting with a client, the first thing I say is don't tell me anything. I don't want to know anything. Just I'm going to tune in. I'm going to ask permission to tune in. And then I see how they see. So if they're clairvoyant, I see clairvoyant. If they're clairaudient, I see clairaudient. If they're clairsentient, I see clairsentient. And whatever their belief system is. So if I have five people in front of me and they all... She's really trying to come in. And they're all um, different belief systems. Then I see how they see. But the beautiful part is, guess what? This one's an alien. This one's an angel. This one is a fairy. This one is nothing. It's all the same. It's just the way in which that soul is here and has chosen to embody that experience. So that we can collectively bring different energy <laughs> To this space. Are you saying that all aliens, angels, and other beings are basically the same thing? It's just the way we interpret them? I believe so, yes. I believe so. Um, and I believe that they're interpreting themselves that way as well. Because here's one of the biggest things. You know, I'll be doing a class with somebody and I'll be talking about, okay, I want you guys to ground in, do your grounding te technique. We're going to travel and we're going to connect to your high self and to your high self, to your guides, right? To the different guides. And there's more than one. So, you know, I'm not saying that there's just this one energy and that's everything. But what I'm saying is that, yes, I will see people with the same exact guide and they're showing up in different ways for that person. And so we'll start tuning into that guide or that collective and I'll say, all right, guys, just as much as they're here to help you, guess what? We're here to help them in their dimension. So, you know, a lot of times I'll do a whole thing on how can we be of service? You know, you, you're coming here, we're, 
we're praying, we're asking for guidance, we're asking for protection. We want Archangel to come and clear the energy. And that's amazing and beautiful. But maybe Archangel Michael needs us to clear the energy for him and his aspect in consciousness and realm. We are all collectively working together in a cycle. And we're all here supporting each other, period. I think you bring him a great point or a great question that many people have. And that is, how can a specific guide, let's say Archangel Michael, appear to so many different people at the same time? That's a beautiful concept. So when we're working with our guided space, our higher selves, our consciousness, our timelines, right? It's all happening at the same time. So for example, when I'm doing a past life regression, we'll go into the past lives for them to pull whatever it is they need out, whether it's magical or trauma or family ancestor or whatever, but we're bringing it into the now. We'll go into the future, but we're bringing it into the now because now is where it's at, right? <clears throat> so at the same moment, when we're connecting and our belief system is angels or aliens or everything, you know, for me, I have this passion for all the spaces, right? So if it's all those things, whatever it is, then, sorry, then we'll connect to that consciousness of frequency, right? So I want you to kind of imagine something. It's like, here's this big, huge pillar of energy, right? And each pillar of energy, there's segments. It's kind of like the heart chakra, right? The heart chakra has 12 points. Why does it have 12 points? Because it's connecting to 12 other chakras. That's connecting to 12 more, 15 more, however many points that chakra has. Because we have 144 and more in our body, right? Each center point is a hub of energy. And each hub of energy is a frequency of pillars, like this pillar that's connecting in sacred geometry in our bodies. It's the same outside. So as those pillars of energy are sitting and holding that space, they're transmitting specific, inner, specific information. And that specific information is being transmitted to each point of energy. And they're learning. So I'm going to break it down even further. So let's say the pillar on the right is truth. The pillar on the left is compassion. The pillar in front of you is overcoming challenges. You know, each pillar, core point, core fundamental, is a representative of the specific aspect of consciousness. When we decide to come and have this experience on earth, we're learning a certain thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is why we have our signs, right? It isn't like, oh, I just came in as a Libra. You know, I came in as a Libra. How many times have I been here as a Libra? Because you go through all the moon cycles of each sign because you're learning a lesson of those things. It's like an Aries that says, oh, I'm an Aries. I'm supposed to be hard headed. No, honey, you're an Aries because your point is to learn how to overcome being hard headed, right? So when you are one of these pillars, you make it an agreement to come here onto the planet. Those guides of that pillar of energy, that contractor agreement, will be holding space in that frequency. And then when you come into your life, they're really trying to come in. When you come into your life and you're having this experience in it, you're going to pull for those guides. So they're sending the energy. And because there's no sense of time, they're in all the spaces at once because there's no sense of time. It's just merely, okay, this is this pillar that we're working with of energy. We're going to spin this frequency down. And the beautiful part is, is how alone everybody may feel. We are completely together because someone across the world can be experiencing a very similar, if not the same experience as somebody else. And their energy is calling in this frequency that's coming down into that timeline. That's what's creating that frequency of timeline, that consciousness of grid, right? Because it's all the energies that are in that space of alignment. 
And that's why you hear people talking about that timeline shift where you have to choose. We're on two timelines, people. You got to choose which one you want. That's coming up a lot. The deal with that is facing self, not facing self, not facing self. You're going to have to continue going through those hard challenges and kind of get punched. So it's going to be a different timeline. It's like the Mandela effect, right? Facing self, we're going to go through a transformation together in this pillar. But either way, nobody's alone because there's a collective that's choosing not to and a collective that's choosing to. You talked about Maki Audit a couple of times, and I'm not clear on who or what that is. No, so, Macchiata is the Native American word for Bigfoot. Okay. And we have songs for him um, and her, and they are a very big part of Mount Shasta. Since you live there, have you seen many UFOs flying around? Oh my gosh, yes, all the time. Even the kids. We had a big spaceship above us a few years back, and my boys were like, Mom, it's like freaking Star Trek. <laughs> wow. I was like, that's yeah, a big ship. Yeah. Do you think that there is a base inside the mountain? A hundred percent. Yeah, the mountain is very interesting. So Mount Shasta is over 590,000 years old. And um, according to, you know, science. And what's really interesting to me is Mount Shasta is actually three volcanoes in one. There's more than three volcanoes around Mount Shasta, and Black Butte is a, is a very, very old volcano. But Mount Shasta specifically, when it gets to the point, it's, it points into three different volcanoes. And what you'll see if you come up to Shasta, which is very, very interesting, is each side of the mountain, the three sides, the Trinity, are completely different landscapes. And the reason why they're completely different landscapes is because there's three different, totally different volcanoes. So one is producing massive lava. One is producing massive, massive waterfalls and thick, thick trees. And one is producing more of that volcanic front where, yeah, there's woods and trees, but it has that kind of bald spot where you can climb up in two and a half hours. You know, people will be like, I went to the top of the Mount Chest in two and a half hours. And I'm like, what side did you climb on? Because actually, to really honestly climb Mount Shasta, it takes about a month. And it's dangerous. And it's amazing. Have you ever encountered any ETs around Mount Shasta living here with us? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, I've encountered ETs my whole life, but um, especially in Vegas. <laughs> and mm. you can always spot them out. Because in Vegas? Don't eat. Oh, yeah. What do they look I like? Was, uh, well, these ones were wearing, so I've had some, I'm going to get into some UFOs or some ETs. All right. <laughs> so in Vegas, um, they were pretty much in a meat suit. That's what I call it. They're like in a human suit. You can tell because of their demeanor, you know, how they're sitting. It's kind of like the cone heads, right? And so they, they don't know what to eat. They don't know how to speak. And they're just kind of sitting and watching and just very uh, stoic kind of energy because they don't know what expression it is. They're, they're just trying to learn and observe. Um, in Mount Chasta, I've had a lot of experiences, but I'll talk about one couple because it's a, it's a funny story and it uh, shows kind of the dualities. So here I am, in, I'm in Chasta and I'm meeting with some people that were referred to me. We were doing a bowl session. And we're walking down this long hall and I look at the wife and I look at the husband and I said, um, your wife, she's, she's showing. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, I can see her tail and I can see her eyes. You know, she was a reptilian. And he goes, oh my gosh, she's having a hard time with her hologram. You know, he's like, they've been here for like 20 years. And I said, yeah, I just, I'm letting you know, like 3D. I can see her, you know, she's starting to expose herself. And he says, you're not scared. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I live in Mount Shasta. <laughs> of course, I'm not scared. And so we ended up meeting up later. He wanted to do some business with me. We ended up meeting up later. And uh, I'm in the car. And it was crazy. First of all, before I'm in the car, 
we're going to back up a little. We meet up later. I drive to his house in Sacramento. I walk in the house and I knew I was like, whoa, super aliens. They had no, no food in the entire house except for a large amount of bananas. It was like the entire counter was covered with bananas. They had no beds. They had almost no furniture. And they just had an altar room. That's it. In the whole house, it was huge, huge house, nothing in it, just a ton of bananas and an altar room, and that was it, right? So we get huh? that's pretty wild, <laughs> right? Freaky. And then I'm kind of a little bit freaked out because here I am by myself and I'm going into their house, and I'm still aware that they're not from this planet, that they're here on assignment, and with my life experience of everything that's happened to me through my life and being abducted since I was three, I was kind of like, all right, let's, you know, I didn't fully go into the house. kind of It's like I went into the kitchen and that was about it. So um, I come out of the house, we get in the car, he's sitting there next to me and I look over and he has three dots right here well like it's like right here on his hairline and his hairline is separated and so first I just noticed the three dots and I looked at him and then I noticed there is a separation and something else under his skin suit right and so at first I said do some time in prison did you like I was giving him a hard time you know I mm-hmm. came from the ghetto so that's my crazy life. <laughs> I'm like, why do you have my crazy life? Got you on your side of your head. And I didn't notice that when you were there last time. So I'm kind of paying attention, right? Being a hyper observer. And he goes, what? And I said, your, uh, your skin's coming loose. <laughs> He's like, how does this happen with you? And I, I said, maybe just so you feel comfortable with me, you know? So it was this really powerful experience for me because I was able to encounter and experience their space and their vulnerabilities and and kind of just see it's not really about being human. It's about being a soul. And it doesn't matter what body you have or what suit you're wearing or if you show up as a tree, it's still your soul. That's the expression of self. But did he reveal to you what his assignment is here? No. And what ended up happening was, is I was going to meet another gentleman and they wanted to, he wanted me to build his, um, or he wanted me to build my website um, and all the things I was doing with this gentleman. And when I showed up, I knew who he was and um, I only served the light. So. Why do you think there's so much pain and suffering in this realm? Oh. <laughs> you have good questions, okay. I have to say. Um, you know, it's really interesting. We were in Taiwan, um, and there's a really beautiful soul there who one of his students was driving us, and she had asked a question, and she said, you know, what do you think about karma? And I was talking about all different kinds of things with karma. And she said, so you don't think that karma is just negative and dark? And I said, no. I think that karma is how we perceive it and how we show up for it. And she said, what about the darkness in the world? You know? And one of the biggest things is I, I am a trauma specialist. And I work with people that have had really horrific traumas. Um, really, really horrific traumas. And one of the biggest things is this, nine times out of 10, when we're going through some kind of trauma, we're going through that darkness, it's a part of our past that we need to let go of, whether it be a past life, or maybe it's a different role we're playing, or maybe it's a different lesson, or maybe we have a karma that needs to be healed, or maybe it's a part of a way for us to have a deeper layer of compassion. Because one thing that I realized throughout my life is the deeper I go within myself, the farther out I can go into consciousness. And the more that I understand the layers of pain, the more layers of love I can embody. 
And that is a really powerful moment to understand every abuse that I've had. Um, I have compassion and understanding for that counterpart that played that role. Even when I was a small child, even when I was a little girl and those horrific things happened, I understand where their minds were at. I understand what they were struggling with. And I understand um, their, their mission and what they're supposed to be overcoming and learning and what they're not. Do I believe that there always has to be pain in the world? I do not. My husband does. You know, we were in that 7.5 earthquake in Taiwan on the ninth floor in a skyscraper. And it was a few days before we were in a hotel that was right next to where everything fell. And it was crazy because we had just had a conversation about him saying, look, honey, you know, I believe that the level of pain people experience is based on how their own inner perception of self is and how, where their boundaries are and, and where they're at in their life, but it brings huge blessings. And it was powerful because here we are underneath this table and the whole entire building is shaking and, you know, people are screaming it's it's intense right where and there was not a moment that I was scared I just simply was rubbing my hand on the carpet talking to the earth and I wonder if the pain consciousness you know they say there's no love without pain or sadness without joy and that it's each other's polarity but at some point, we're choosing to be born into those spaces. I mean, I was a little, little girl that didn't choose to be blasted from five to seven. I didn't choose to be strapped down and chained in a bed and violently where my insides were ripped up and they had to freeze my insides. You know, I didn't choose that. However, where's my accountability? Right? I did choose to come into this life and I did choose to have those parents and I did choose to be in the space. They really want to come in, in the space where I'm having these experiences and learning so that I can teach others. So your question is very challenging to answer because I believe it really is determined on or determined on the person. And what they're here to experience, because, you know, a lot of times someone will say, well, that little girl, you know, she was two years old. She didn't choose to get, you know, or she didn't choose to be or whatever it is. You know, yeah, I totally get that. But she did choose her parents and she did choose her life. And there's something going on with the past life. Maybe she was a violent person in the past life. And this is the karma playing out I know that sounds awful it's a baby I want to hug and adopt every baby in the planet I've only adopted one because you know I have five kids <clears throat> but you know and, and the trauma she had to go through to heal at six years old was horrific and it's amazing she's getting ready to go to college she's 18 years old her life is amazing and she really had to work hard I mean when I acquired my daughter at six she was fully possessed so these, you know, these things, this is a hard question to answer because there are so many layers to it. And I know it's, it's very triggery for others, but it all has a purpose. I notice beings keep wanting to come in. Do they have some sort of message that they want to share with us? Um, Now they're all talking. Um, <laughs> they're fighting to come in. I mean, it's really interesting because what's been happening to me lately, I think I'm going through a shift, is that um, I'm starting to just integrate with the energy. And so as that's happening, it's a different space where I don't have to just tune in. They just kind of come in. <laughs> I'm building a different relationship with them. Asher has been really present. Um, and she, she has a really interesting story, but I, you know, she has many names as most of them do. Most of them have many names in their consciousnesses. Um,
Hello, dear one. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for asking and being so present with the space that is so important for people to understand. I have been sitting here with Heather watching the different spaces that are, how do you say, questions for so many people. Heather mentioned more than once that somebody wanted to come in. So I just thought that I would offer perhaps that you or another being would like to share some sort of message with us. There's many of us here today. As always, she's learning a different, um, we are learning to embody with her so that we are with her all the time. And she just is in the space. So when she's saying that, it's her learning how to adapt to feeling us so closely within her. She is always open to learning at the same time. It's a new experience. So we're trying to help her adjust to that. Um, eventually, it, we will just come through and then nothing will be said. Uh, what we are doing here is trying to give hmm, trying to give deeper layers of understanding so that people can see what's happening with them the things you see with people like heather it isn't so much about oh she had this or that it's it's more about she is able to show through example of what everybody is experiencing in their own way some people may experience these things maybe by driving down the street and noticing things, maybe by listening to you, maybe by simply sitting with their animal that really is just a conscious extension of their own selves or a space that they would like to be in. There's magic. Uh, magic is not the right word, but it's a good way to kind of explain the differences. So it, there's this layer of magic, if you will, or a different layer of perception that you can apply in your life and in any way. Um, you're driving in your car and there's a light. You stop at the light, a car comes by, runs the light, barely misses another car. This is part of that collective. And we have many people and many beings here to help each soul and uh, walking the path in the questioning is good, but there needs to be an understanding. We can know many things, but without understanding it, it's not truly known. Many people are going to be watching this video so while you have this audience, do you have some general message for humanity, especially in a way that can help them? To see the layers of you, uh, let go of the questioning and start to be. Uh, many changes are about to occur in our world system, and it is not just here on Earth that it is being felt. This is why so many channelers are coming through. This is why there's so many people coming through with the near-death experiences and the, um, we call it connecting, um, the, what do you call, ET, your, your outer, outer planet experiences. These things are becoming more and more seen because change is already here. And where you focus your awareness is how you're going to experience it. Being in the eye of the storm is going to assist you in being an observer and being able to watch what's going on and not so much participate. 
ma ha shu to ta la ina ta ka ta shi na ta la ina ta la i shu to pa ta ko to ona ina ti ta ra ka ta ai to shu ma la ina ta ka li i to hu sha ta ka ana a they are saying that there's many talking today from different places and what they're saying that they would like us to communicate to you is start to focus on the inner self and what you want to achieve building community starts with your family being open to these spaces of self and recognizing that what you're feeling is not wrong and that sometimes what we feel might be scary but it isn't about taking action all the time sometimes it's about simply being okay with self this may sound different for some of you because you may be waiting for some extravagant magical tree of energy or stargate that comes down and we all walk through and the world is shifted but what's really going on here is that the planet is moving with our change because the planet is created by our own external expression right even us up here we are participating in the creation of all things just as you are because everything that is inside of you is also in the planet it's um when you take an animal and you put it in a box it only grows to the size of that box the planet is the same it is expanding as you expand and the conscious this is why we are all here right now to help you um bridging the difference between what you call science and what you call spirit and what you call religion what you call all these things are beautiful call them what you feel them to be because it's your experience however remember that they all belong to bridge right they all work together as a big picture and being open to that is very very important in the timeline that's coming i believe your name is astrid where are you from? Her name is Ashra. She's left. Oh, okay. She left already. All right. Well, that's There's okay. another being coming in. Ashra. Her name is Ashra and she is a um yeah, she there there's a whole group which um there yeah, there's a whole group here today. From what she said, it sounds like channeling is something new for you. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, channeling in public and understanding that that's what it is, is new for me, yes. This is definitely a new, um, I have never been public. I've been word of mouth for my whole life. And Ruben Langdon and my husband were like, Heather, it's time for you to come out of the closet. So it um, has been a lot for me. And the level of channeling that I'm doing now is completely different. Before it would be um, a channel in a moment. So I would be doing a reading, a being would come in, they would speak, it would go. Now it's like I'm having a conversation and a person's coming in. So it's a very different, have I channeled my whole life? Yes. Have I channeled like this? Absolutely not. <laughs> So it is very new for me in a lot of ways, having so many beings there. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to know that I'm part of your going public party today. Yes, I'm very grateful. And um, 
I, I was very hesitant to do that. And Ruben and one of my teachers, she they were doing a cruise ship and um, told the lady, you need to have Heather on here. And so the lady called me and said, everybody had a year and a half to plan and you have a month and a half when she on this ship. And, and I feel like that was really um, my coming out party, if you will, for the first, like, okay, I'm, I'm not just word of mouth, you know, teaching classes. And then Ruben said, and my husband, you need to start your own show. So I started to get tailored, form fit yourself to your soul. And it's very eclectic, right? <laughs> well, where can people and watch that show? Get tailored.love, G E T T A Y L O R E D dot love. And um, so I started that. And then it went up to another one where I was like, okay, it's time for you to get on podcasts. So I've been pretty much like doing that and getting on podcasts. But you know what's really powerful about your show, Jeff? And I really want to talk about this. All right. What's really powerful is, you know, I've been doing multiple, I've probably been on, I don't know, 10 or 15 podcasts just in the last month, right? And I did not channel in all of them and they were all different topics and different things. But with that being said, from the moment Rob messaged me and, and Ruben and said, hey, you know it, you know, I'm going to contact Jeff, you need to get on his show. I was. Uh, feeling what you're doing and feeling you and I was talking to my assistant and I was like I'm really feeling his energy and it's hilarious to me like not ha ha but interesting hilarious kind of moment because your energy of what I'm experiencing here is exactly the energy that I was experiencing not face to face with you and that is a rare thing I've actually only met one other person like that, which is my husband. They call him Zen Ben or the A avatar with an arrow, mm. <laughs> you know, um, very different energy, very big boom, very quiet. But I was very honored to really feel who you are because you, you feel very authentic and you feel that you're, you're really here to just get the message and to, to eat good soul food and that's really pretty awesome so i just wanted to thank you thank for you for being you well thank you i appreciate that and i thought i should let people know when you mentioned rob for those of you who may or may not know she's talking about rob gothier who we just had on last week and he channeled aradith and when you mention reuben you're talking about reuben langdon we've been in discussion about having him on and he travels a lot and I don't think we've solidified a date yet, <laughs> but Ruben yeah. is also on Gaia TV and you've been a guest on his show, right? Yeah, I'm the uh, last two episodes of season three, mm -hmm. um, but you'll find that those, uh, those episodes haven't been released yet on Gaia. They only have the first 12 episodes. So you can go to interviewwithed.org or interviewwithed.com. And you can take a look and he has a bunch. You can also go to my website and find a link. Ruben is a dear friend of mine and a business partner. Um, we are owners of, with two others, of Lemurian Life Expo, which is a beautiful event of channelers and workshops and animal communicators and um, bowl masters that are coming together in Mount Shasta at the College of the Siskiyou. So we're supporting our students and that's so sacred and important to us one of our other business owners is ken who owns spectrum so he'll be live streaming the event so you can live stream or go in person and you can go to the website lumerianlifeexpo.com uh, you can also find that on my website and ruben is also on my show get tailored because when he talked me into doing the show i was like you're co-hosting with me for a little bit <laughs> you know and that little bit turned into a year and we're having a great time. So he's definitely soul family for sure. That's great. Well, what else do you have that you're working on that you want people to know about? You know, 
honestly, guys, find what feels good to you. I would suggest you can go to, to gettailored.love or you can go to perfectbalance.love um, and just have fun on there. There's videos, there's you know all kinds of information. There's the five elements of you handbook, which I teach a course in the five elements of you. Um, it's a 16 week course for the certification. Certification is a prerequisite, which is required to go into the mastery classes, which is like focused classes, right? So if you wanna learn psychic surgery right now, I'm currently working with five different surgeons, 3D surgeons, and teaching them how to integrate psychic surgery because it creates an acceleration in healing. So those are really powerful classes. If you wanna learn herbology, if you just simply want to grow yourself, that's a great place to start. The five elements of you is really about the fundamentals of your true self <clears throat> and all that you are. The five elements of you is mental, which is higher activation, emotional, which is discernment and water, uh, physical, which is self-worth and earth, containment, bringing all of those things in, which is your spirit, your air. And then finally, the fifth element, which is ether, ethereal. How are you impacting people externally and how is the external world impacting you? And what is your selection in that? So it's really important and beautiful because it doesn't matter what your gift is. It doesn't matter what you want to do. You want to grow a business where make sure your family is healthier, more grounding. Maybe you want to escape some kind of trauma or heal a trauma. Whatever it is, the fundamental five elements of you are key gateways, period, no matter what you believe. And they saved my life. And now I'm being guided to teach that course. So it's, it's a lot of fun and it's really powerful. The two episodes for Reuben Langdon's interview with Ed, um, the feedback has been people have watched it multiple times because each time they watch it, they're unveiling a different layer of themselves. That was really my prayer, was that the experience in life that I've gone through was the example to help people find themselves. And so I hope that is something that's found, you know, and if it's not, then have fun and watch it. Because remember, guys, like we're supposed to be enjoying our life. You know, I, I have a lot of fun going out into the woods and talking to Macchiata and talking to the fairies and, you know, Ruben and my husband and I, which is this in part two, we have footage. We were doing B-roll. We were finishing up this series that we've been working on for three and a half years and we actually there was only a car length of snow four feet deep and we got stuck and my husband disappeared and we were stuck for 18 hours and he was stayed on the same road he ended up on the other side of the mountain it should have taken him 12 to 18 hours to get there he got there in six and um he said honey I went through Telos the trees changed, the sky changed, the star system changed. And there's no way he could have arrived where he arrived in the middle of the night if he hadn't in the time frame that he did. So there's a lot of beautiful confirmations in what we're creating. And I would love to hear your creations, guys, and, and feel into what you're experiencing. Because at the end of the day, it's really just about learning from each other. And that's what's important. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and communicate with you or ask you questions. Are you open to that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, that's actually my joy. I love to just be with people and be present with them and hear what they have to say and where they're coming from. You know, and, and, they're, and, and I don't know how much time we have, so I don't want to take too much time from you, but there is one more being that wants to come in. Is that okay? Sure. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Hello, how are you today? Great. Who are you that's with us? I am the being of consciousness that works with the collective. We do not have a name, yet we work together solely and together separately. 
Well, thank you for joining us. Do you have a message for humanity? Yes. There are many people living in fear space. There is no time for that. It is not about not having fear, but it is about what you allow into your space. Please find another place to look inside yourself as change is here and how we are affected is how you are affected. Can I ask you how you made contact initially with Heather? We have been with her since the beginning. She is not from this planet. She is merely here to be a conduit of energy so that we can work through her. What planet is she from? All planets, no planets. Is she part of your soul family? She is part of all soul family. Are you saying that all of us are just one family? Yes and no. Would you say that we are all God? Yes and no. Okay. We are fragments, fragments of spaces and time, fragments learning different parts of space and time. And then we come together, give the information to each other and go off into the next space and repeat. Do you or any of your friends ever incarnate here on the earth with us? Every day. In what way? Always. Sometimes through children that can take the energy because it is us coming through, but we must leave parts behind. That is why we are here in the collective, in our groups, in consciousness, so that we can feed the information into the body as it is ready to take it on. Otherwise, the body on this planet will fail. Information overload can only be delivered in spaces and times that it is ready. That is why the near-death experiences occur. These beings have energy that they need to download and cannot until their body can change into that accepted frequency. Would you say that is your primary mission here, or is there something else? Yes and no. Our primary mission is to assist this planet in its growth process to allow it to be in the timeline that creates prosperity, prosperity, searching, searching, searching new words. One moment, please. The growth potential that is connected to all planets. Every planet, every timeline, every consciousness is about connecting. Each part plays an innate role in all that is and all that will be. Everything that was cannot be what is. At the same time, it is ultimately about remembering those times back before things were erased. There was much flow and much magic. The magic that you call magic is simply energy so that the beings that came onto this planet could bring more with them. When the remembering was taken away, less was able to be received. Are humans originally from this planet? Yes and no. Re-ask question in different framework. Have humans' bodies been manipulated by extraterrestrials? Yes and no. Humans' bodies have been manipulated by other humans that are just in skin suits. They're mm, recalculating. Human bodies have been manipulated through their DNA structure and RNA structure to be able to adapt to this planet. Also, there has been memory removed. Because once the memory is removed, then the body can be remolded and less can be transmitted through for memory. This is why it is so important to allow the people that are coming through and awakening to have these aspects of self come through. Like us, we come through so that we can assist you in remembering. We can help you to connect. There are many that are scared and that know in their soul, in their self, in all that they are, that there is more. At the same time, if they look at that direction, then it crumbles the belief systems that they were forced to have. In truth, it crumbles nothing. The crumbling is merely the perspective of fear. Some people say that the earth is going through an ascension and we will be in the fifth dimension. Is there truth to that? Already in fifth dimension. Fourth dimension has been bypassed as it is a stationary place for beings in the realms of spirit to stay through this transformation. Fifth dimension and beyond, the planet is growing back to its original size. When the planet was broken down into half its size before that, 
when they speak of Palladian times, the planet was actually called Namat, N-A-M-A-A-T. The vowels were elongated because it was bringing in frequency and energy. When that planet was split in half, it was not from something outside. It was from inside. It was from working with energy that should have been respected and was not. And when that happened, it took half the memory because this planet Earth is the extension of the people here. As much as it grows and remembers is as much as you grow and remember. What caused the Earth to be split in half? Greed, power, intrigue, curiosity gone wrong. There's an asteroid belt somewhere out there, I think, between earth and mars or mars and another planet is that the other half? that is the remains of the rest of the planet do you think that extraterrestrials will be walking around on the planet and obvious to humans anytime soon already walk planet already here already in space and time and present on planet have always been walking through realm systems that people will come into the understanding and witness this space once they have fully awakened, we only have about 25 percent of awakening, and in that 25 percent of awakening, they need more awakening. Those that feel they are awakened are usually the ones that are not awakened. Hmm. Interesting. What do we need to do to awaken ourselves? Let go of the box that you live in and be open to see from other perspectives. Look at your emotional body and let go of attachment. It does not mean that we don't choose things to be in our presence because we do as well as you. As the time goes on, if you have an attachment to the outcome or end result of things, then it will keep you from where you are. This is very important. The question becomes letting go of attachment and being able to find joy in what you experience without having an expectation of how it turns out. Would you say this is also true for manifestation? Yes. Manifestation is also in the physical. It works through the body just as it does a soul because the body is the expression of the soul. When you see a body that has a problem, weight, health, mental, it is merely the soul trying to align itself to itself. And that expression coming from the physical body is showing the soul what needs to be adjusted. A lot of people are suffering on this planet. What can they do to ease their suffering? Look inside self, see where they're accountable. What do they need to do to forgive the past? How do they need to look at being soulful? This being speaks a lot of soulful. Selfful is different than selfless and selfish. Selfful is the balance of both. There are polarities in all things. Find the balance in that. If you are living in a space of woe is me and why of me, instead of living in a space of this is what happened and how do I need to face the pain of it to walk through, then you will sit in suffering. Suffering happens because of the inability to see the space and time of your own living of your own current exchange. Is your past experiences becoming the life that you are living now? Is the choices that you made attached to the past or are the choices that you're making now complete in the now? Can you see future events? And if so, do you see or can you share anything that is coming up for us this year in 2024? Much change is coming in 2024. It is still in the weight lines of how that is experienced because not change computing. Choices that have not fully been made, we are still waiting for that free will. Destiny is destiny. Change will occur. This planet will evolve and the darkness will fall away and no longer become the leader. The timing of that is where free will comes in. So it depends on where the focus is. If you're focused on the fear and you're focused on trying to stop it in an aggressive way, then you only create more aggression. If you show up from a space of love and you focus on how you can bring that into space and time and focus on the changes that you can make to bring the goodness into the world, 
while still being aware of the darkness come around coming around you then you will be able to change the frequency in which we experience our timeline as a collective. The people in charge today are going through a huge shift themselves because everything is changing. Everything is growing. This timeline of change is completely dependent on consciousness as a whole, consciousness in a group, consciousness in a singular cell, consciousness in a family. There is much here that is in change and flux. To give a timeline of the change would be something that is not tangible, hold, hold. you cannot hold on to because of this free will. However, the change will happen. And where you are in that space is completely dependent on how much you have looked inside yourself and found the true key to your own healing as the energy that you admit externally will impact how this consciousness plays out. Do you think that humans will ever at some point start combining themselves with technology and become part robot? Already happening, just not in the way that you think. AI is a huge part of creation. We are all creators. Just as a mother has a baby, we create businesses, we create connection, we create technology. Technology is an extension of that. Just like the guides and beings that work with us have created their spaces and they work with us to assist not only what they're growing, but what we're growing. Because as we grow, they grow. This is the same for us. This is the same for you. This is the same for technology of the AI. This does not mean that we will become a or you will become, or they will become something different that is not natural because everything that is going through the changes of time is part of the natural process and order. The only time it becomes not natural is when control takes over, agenda is present, and fear is running the show. Well, I don't have any more questions for you. Do you have one final message for us? Find in yourself what you need to look at it may sound simple or silly, but your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts, and where you are in your life completely impacts all of us. Earth, every timeline, every planet, every consciousness, because you are just as special as every other being. You are just as special as this being. We all need each other, and we all need to value who we are, who we're going to be, and how we choose to connect in this world, that world, all worlds all timelines. Thank you for being here to hear the transmission. We are now disconnecting. That one's a little bit different than Astra. Right. The dialect or the vocabulary that that one used almost sounded like it was part AI. So what it is, which is really interesting um, on the cruise, Sarah Beckman, uh, Sarah Cosme, mm -hmm. she had me on a QHHT table and I answered people's questions and did healings while the beings did through me. And whenever they come in, it's, I'm on a ship. I'm literally, my being is on a spaceship and they are a collective and they're, and this isn't it, but it's kind of like a near-death experience. You can't quite explain it, but you use other things to try and explain it. So it's kind of like they have this computer board, if you will. And they're all, right? They're communicating to each other in different languages. And then they're transmitting it into this board. And then that board is going through me using my communication and, and my data field to communicate what they're trying to say. So it's okay. kind of like they are using a computer essentially because they don't speak English. So they're trying to translate and it's really hard for them because when they're doing that, sometimes they don't know how to find the word that people will understand. So they're kind of like, you know, it, it comes through an emotion in a feeling um, less than it comes through and it's just different. And they've been with me forever. Even when I was a little kid, I think they were the first ones that abducted me. They were my safety when I was little. Oh. 
was interesting talking to them. Yeah, they're different. <laughs> they're definitely, and I wish you could see them because they all look totally different mm -hmm. and their languages are very different. And I think that's probably why I started, I don't call it light language, I call it soul language. And I believe that all of our souls have a different frequency in which we emit and communicate that, right? And one time I was with a realtor, he was Egyptian, and I was like, someone's trying to talk to you in another language. I'm so sorry, do you have permission? And he says, yes. And I start speaking, and he says, you're speaking Egyptian. I was like, I am? <laughs> you know, I had no idea. But I feel like they, they really helped me as a little kid to become the translator in the soul language because they speak so many different languages. They're like a council of beings that are here for one purpose. So that's why they don't give themselves a name because they're, they're not about being labeled as a name. They're just kind of, they're more fundamental. They're more like, hey, this is what's going on. They're very direct. Where Asherah is more like, like love and like a Lemurian and she's more, you know, it's a different higher self connecting versus there's a whole committee of beings telling me, well, not even telling me what to do. They're just taking me over and I'm sitting on a ship with them. Well, Heather, before we wrap it up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Oh my gosh, you guys, let go of your fear. It's, um, our journeys are endless. They're always here. And whatever it is you're facing or going through or can't explain or want to learn more about, we're all here to help each other do that. And you're not alone. And we're really excited to be with you. Heather, thank you for your message. And thank you for being my guest. Oh, thank you so much. I am very, very grateful. And then uh, as always, uh, definite no expectations here. And I uh, <laughs> was a little surprised, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I actually only ended up sharing one near-death experience. So that's pretty powerful for them to take over like that. Well, that is a good thing for me because now I have another or more reasons to bring you back because we can talk about your other NDEs. Yeah, I, I'm super open to be here, guys. And I... Uh, I think what Jeff is doing is so beautiful and so amazing. And I am very grateful to be here in this small way. And uh, I look forward to meeting all of you soon. Have a great day. Thank you. I'm grateful for having you. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Oh, yeah. I'm going to cuddle with the grandbaby. <laughs> <laughs> and eat fake ice cream. There you go. All right, Jeff, thank you so much. You have a blessed day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.